everybody. My name is Alex Elliott, and I am the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, which is a nonprofit university in San Francisco. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to On Journeying into the Landscapes of Our Ancestors. Uh, while I know we all are joining from different places from all over the world, as a representative of CIIS, I want to acknowledge our debt and gratitude to the Ramaytush Ohlone, who are the original peoples and continual caretakers of the San Francisco Peninsula. CIIS campus is located on the traditional unceded lands of the Ramaytush Ohlone, which are known as Yalamu in the Ramaytush Ohlone language. This acknowledgement is just one very small step towards being in deeper connection and relationship with indigenous tribes and organizations in our community. And it doesn't begin to acknowledge all of the native lands, languages and territories where you are right now or where you live and work every day. So I want to invite you to take a moment now to acknowledge the land where you reside and commit to learn more about the native communities near you and support their work. If it feels right for you to share in the chat uh, where you're coming from or about the Native uh, people near you, please do. Uh, we always recommend native-land.ca as a starting resource. Before we get started tonight, I have a couple of quick general tips and troubleshooting items to go over. We are having a live Q&A today for anybody who is watching live. So please submit your questions at any time using the web form, uh, which is linked in the event description just below this video. Um, we do have automatically generated captions turned on for this event, which you can toggle on and off using the closed captioning button right in YouTube. As you may have noticed, chat is enabled for this event, but please note it is not being moderated and our presenters cannot see that chat. Chat is not required to fully experience this event, and if you find that it's uh, negatively impacting your experience in any way, we encourage you to just turn it off. Uh, if you do choose to participate in chat, please be respectful and avoid language that could be offensive or insensitive to others. If you are having issues with your audio or video, we always suggest that you start by refreshing the page, and then if you're still having issues, uh, it can help to adjust your video settings or lower that video quality right within YouTube. Now let me first introduce our presenters, Laura and James, and then we will get to their conversation. Laura Pastarfi is adjunct faculty in philosophy and religion and director of the Psychedelic Assisted Therapies and Research Certificate Program here at CIIS. Her scholarly work examines trees and plants in Western thought, with particular focus on philosophical literature, in order to explore an arboreal and vegetal ontology and ethics that respects plants themselves. Her interests include plant studies, integral ecology, psychedelic theory, and environmental humanities, especially environmental philosophy, eco-phenomenology, and religion and ecology. She is currently working on a volume co-edited with Dr. David McCauley, tentatively titled The Wisdom of Trees, Thinking Through Arboreality, expected to be published in 2024. She lives in the San Francisco Bay Area on occupied indigenous territory of the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo, represented by the Federated Indians of Grattan Rancheria. Dr. James Canton runs the Wild Writing MA at the University of Essex in England and is the author of Grounded, The Oak Papers, Ancient Wonderings, and Out of Essex, Reimagining a Literary Landscape, which was inspired by his rural wandering in East Anglia. He reviews and writes for the Times Literary Supplement, The Guardian, and Resurgence Magazine. His two most recent books, The Oak Papers and Grounded, A Journey into the Landscapes of Our Ancestors, were published in the U.S. by Harper One. He is a regular on British television and radio and lectures frequently. He lives in Essex, England. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Laura and James. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Alex. And thank you especially to you, James. So as Alex mentioned, we're here to speak about your book, Grounded, A Journey into the Landscape of Our Ancestors. And the, the book is such a, a an exploration and, and deep inquiry into place, 
history and the natural world, as well as our, our human connection with, with something more. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, th well, thanks, Laura, and, and thanks, uh, CIS, for inviting me along. It's, uh, it's a conversation I've been looking forward to for a while. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, good to chat. Good to chat with people uh, from all over. I'm hoping we've got people from all over. I mean, I'm I'm tucked away here. It's dark. It's it's England. It's quite cold today, actually, for an autumn day. Um, you know, and but I'm I'm kind of fascinated that we're able to do this kind of conversation with with you guys over on the west coast of uh, America, and hopefully with an audience from I'm not quite sure where, but all over. And hopefully people will tell us where they're from in, in the chat. I always like, that's always a nice connection. Uh, it's, it's fascinating, especially as we're talking about land to be yeah. coming from all over. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think, I think, you know, hearing, I mean, after, you know, a period of time of the two of us chatting happily away for about landscape, I'm sure it will be really nice to hear from some of the audience about where they come from and, you know, the, the lands that, that they, that they spend their, their lives upon as well. I am really looking forward to that. Uh, well, I have several questions for you, and cool. um, I know that you've you've done quite a bit of traveling in your life, and, and you've written about those experiences, some of which Alex mentioned. But in, in Grounded, you write about specific sites that are local to you in England, um, hmm. a lot of them near Essex, but all, all across England, including churches and the ancient English stone circles. I'm, I'm curious if you could share a little bit about what your process was for finding sites to investigate for the book. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Laura. It's a, it's a, it's an intriguing one. I mean, I've been writing this book that that became grounded for, uh, as as often happens. I think I just spent ages kind of working ideas and and writing sort of passages that eventually kind of coalesce, if you like. But I think grounded in particular, it it became known in my kind of um, you know archives as the kind of the sacred spaces book you know and, and friends of mine and colleagues would would be like oh yeah you, you're still working on that are you um, and uh, as much as anything it was it, it began very much with a kind of exploration of the idea of in in a way what what the notion of the sacred is um, I was I'm kind of intrigued by this um, I'm not a practicing religious person in any sense but I'm intrigued by religion and, and and a number of religions if I can put it like that you know so um I mean and where I live is is very much in 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 rural um English countryside so if you if you were to say to anyone in the in the tiny village where I live uh can you go and show me a sacred place in within a mile say within a couple of kilometers um, they would take you to the local church. And, uh, you know, so this was definitely a kind of part of my thinking was to be going that, you know, we're very fortunate in Britain in that we have some some remarkable churches and chapels, Christian uh, sacred sites, if you like. Um, and that was very much a kind of a layer that, that I wanted to explore in the book. But what I also wanted to do in the book was go to go deeper into the landscape if you like to go into some of the some of the more obvious sacred sites that were pre-christian so i mean i'm sure everyone will, will if i say stonehenge everyone can kind of picture stonehenge and and kind of imagine that and obviously to a certain extent that there were there were these obvious sites in in a place like britain that i would talk about and i wanted to talk about that in the context of my my kind of my time of traveling and living in other places around the world and, and, and try to see a kind of aspects of commonality in, in what we do as humans to, to turn land sacred uh, if we do, or is all land sacred? Um, and, and this kind of idea. And essentially with the book, with, with this specific book, I mean, obviously what I'm talking about is, is a huge project. You know, I, I wanted to include places like, Machu Picchu or you know I mean I, I used to live in Egypt and there are quite a few sacred sites in Egypt that I was kind of uh, interested in exploring but essentially what happened with as I started to sort of, sort of knuckle down and actually write the book um, what happened was we had uh, we had COVID kick in and um, in many ways what it what it absolutely for I mean it was right at the beginning so I'd written a certain amount of the book and I was suddenly put in a situation where I, you know, 
well, like we all were, were put into a, a, a kind of very uh, powerful situation of the only places that, that we could see were, were those absolutely on our doorstep. And I was very lucky in that, I, as I say, I live in a rural village and I've got a really old bicycle. And what I would do is we were allowed to go out, you know, for a journey on your own. And so I had about a five mile radius. And and so what happened with the book is that I, I started to realize that I wanted to be as much as anything exploring this idea of, of seeking the sacred on all of our doorsteps because it is there. I mean, it is there and it's just a a kind of a practice of how you kind of go about this. Um, and as I say, in, in my village, you've got kind of two options when you walk out of your door in terms of a kind of communal space. Uh, one is a restaurant at the end of the road and the other one is a church. So uh, it was pretty obvious which one I was going to find, probably find more sacredness at. So that was kind of how the book began. And, and then it became this idea of, um, what is sacred? What are the what are the kind of characteristics of of a place on the landscape that we know humans for for a long period of time have gone to and have seen as kind of special and uh, yeah. And if you like, there were certain words I'd start using. Sacred or numinous was a, a word that I particularly liked to use as well, which had a sense of kind of godliness to to that site. So um, that was kind of how my practice emerged, if you like, anyway, yeah. Uh, thank you. And I, I think it's interesting that you, you really chose to focus on the place that you, you knew well. And I, I'm curious how that, that inquiry originally started for you. So mm. could you maybe share something about how you came to see the land as sacred? Was that something that you felt when you were young or is it something that you really came to as an adult or, or through the process of, of thinking through this book? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think, you know, um, like a, a, as soon as you start to to think about it in many ways, I mean, I, there was a, I think when I was a child, I grew up in a kind of in London, in a very kind of suburban world. Um, I, and I was one of those kids that you'd always find kind of like in the garden sort of sitting up a pear tree we had a pear tree in our garden and i just would spend a lot of time just sitting in a in a pear tree um it was like it was a really nice place but in, in some ways for me i would kind of if if anyone would say to me you know what 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 were the kind of sacred spaces of your childhood i'd have to say a pear tree and i think you know this idea that uh, a sacred place is a kind of human construct is is something that i think in a way I was kind of working through in the book to a certain extent. And one of the key people, one of the key people that I turned to, I mean, obviously I turned to wiser heads to try and get a sense of this. And I've, I think I've, you know, from reading, you know, my youth reading quite a lot of travel writing and when I was traveling a lot, so, you know, reading, I was just chatting about the book, Bruce Chatwin's The Stop the Song Lines, if anyone knows that book, for example, from the 1980s. I was talking about that last night and about the idea of, um, you know, native sacred spaces in, in the Australian continent. And, and Chatwin talks about these song lines that connect these places. So obviously reading makes you recognize the, the kind of sacred layerings to the, to the world. Um, but it was, it, was, it was one of America's finest living minds um, that, that what really kind of took me into different spheres, which was Wendell Berry. And... Um, Wendell Berry, let me get the, the specific quote because it's worth just, just making sure that I get it right because it's really worth chewing over this one, I think. And I, I chewed over it for a long time. Uh, and it's, um, Wendell Berry says, there are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. And it takes a little while. I mean, I'm still not sure if I'm, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. but. I think one of the things that, that comes out of that is the idea that all nature is sacred, if you like, uh, and, and that maybe as humans, what we do is in certain places in nature, we kind of create a kind of super sacredness to it. And you can see that because that tends to be, certainly in my kind of English uh, landscape context, that's, that tends to be 
uh, where the churches are. And that's not to say that, that there was nothing there pre-Christian, but the churches were very much uh, often placed on sites of pre-Christian worship. So the people that were there 4,000, 5,000, even further back, you know, beyond the early, you know, the, the, the kind of the first, those first farming communities that kind of established often places um, of worship. They, they were often on natural sites in the landscape that kind of had a certain, you know, view. They'd have a view over a, a river valley or they'd, you know, often I think, which I find fascinating, and you can, you can see this with Stonehenge, for example, is that um, a lot of the earliest sites that were built in the English context were built that looked out over migrating animal pathways, which is where the the even earlier hunter-gatherer people uh, would see the sacred in the landscape. So you get this kind of mosaic, if you like, this kind of like a kind of textured layering to how you see the landscape. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm entirely answering your question, but it was, you know, it's been, it's it takes a long period of time. And I think you do have to think about it. And of course, I'm very fortunate. I have this, this, uh, this job as director of wild writing at, at the University of Essex, which means I spend a certain amount of time in the classroom in the seminar room, you know, reading books, talking about books, discussing, you know, brilliant people like Wendell Berry or, you know, Barry Lopez is another one who, who always tends to crop up recently. Um, but then we spend a lot of time actually outside in the natural world, in landscape. And I think that is is also one of the the best ways to to see the sacred in the landscape. You, you've got to get out there, haven't you, you know? Um, and uh, and and I'm sure you know that if I a question that I often kind of put to an audience is if I was to come to your neighborhood, what you know where would you take me to that you would consider sacred, or uh, you, you know where would you take me to in the landscape that you considered most special, most significant, and that that's, that's often a good tell I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm curious if you can go even a little deeper into that idea that you mentioned of, of super sacred. How, yeah. how, can you tell tell us a little bit about maybe how that feels or how someone might know that a, a place is super sacred? Yeah, it's not it's not the greatest term, is it? I think in some ways, but I, it's kind of like how do you um, how do you go to that idea that there are lots of sacred places on the landscape without doubt, and as we say. I think what Wendell Berry is, is telling us is that it's humans that turn a place, any place in nature into something that's desecrated, that kind of takes the natural sacredness away. But yeah, I mean, whether the super sacred, if you like, is are those sites where humans over the, over the, the millennia, over thousands and thousands of years have seen something special on that on that place and have in some way marked that place um so you know to use say an obvious um example in in the english context you know something like stonehenge and then up the road from stonehenge you'd have something like uh west kennet long barrow which so again these these were these these stone constructs that were built by the first farmers actually built way before Stonehenge was built, but that, that gets complex. Um, and they were, they were very much formed by taking the stone, that you, the, the larger stone, where you've cleared the land to a certain extent to create fields. And then the larger stone is used to create a monument to some extent, often to, to the dead, to the departed. So, um, you know, this, this is then creating... A, within the landscape a site of special super sacredness if you like and you can kind of see it you know i'm very you know it was great being over in in california back in may which feels quite a long time ago now but it was it was wonderful it's the first time i'd been out to california and uh, obviously we met up laura which was great you took us on a great walk uh, or hike as you would call it uh and um you know, like that was so a one of the kind of 
super sacred sites that I managed to see, I would suggest in in uh, in California that I managed to get to was like the, the West Berkeley Shell Mound, um, which is obviously a very interesting example of the way in which modernity um, and colonialism can can step in in the set in the way that you, you see in that Wendell Berry quote, this idea that it's humans can can turn what is a kind of super sacred, you know, to the to the indigenous Ohlone people who who built that shell mound. This was this was a super sacred site. Uh, you know, and as as we as we know, you know, you know better than I did, only 200 years ago or you know or so, it was still a kind of functioning sacred site. And I think this is the thing, if we go back in time and, and we look at the way that our, our ancestors would um, would see a sacred site is they would often be very mindful, if you like, of, of not disturbing the natural sacredness there. Uh, they might wanna mark a place in some way uh, as important to themselves but they do it in a very, very uh, sympathetic way to the natural landscape that exists there, if you like. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you brought this up because I was also wanting to to bring this this to the fore. And and as I understand, mm. with the the West Berkeley Shell Mound still very much an active sacred site and and contested. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and as you kind of mentioned, I, I'm here in North North America in California and. Yeah. The, the colonial histories and uh, desecration of indigenous sacred sites is very, very real, often with a lot of trauma mm. and pain. Mm. Um, and, and so I, I've, I've, as a, someone from of European descent myself, mm. I've thought that kind of respectfully engaging with the local landscape is very dependent on someone's personal history and situation. Mm. So how how do you see groundedness the way that your your book discusses it working in in landscapes like those in the united states or, or would it be be different yeah it's very it's very interesting isn't it um to compare um sites if you like so uh, as in you know continents even and and the the often the one absolutely startling um important fact that you must not ignore is the presence of colonialism as a kind of destructive power to to if you like to to sacred landscapes i mean you, you cannot you cannot deny that i mean it's it's so central it's so central and and i think you know i come very much and i've been you know working with the idea of grounded very much as on that kind of idea of, the, of my local landscape because i wanted to be um encouraging everyone to be going to their local landscapes and exploring the local sites but it, it is more difficult in some ways in you know if you are living in a downtown urban area where are your sacred sites where are your indigenous sacred places that you know if, if there's no markers on the land how are you meant to know them well okay to a certain extent you you uh you research don't you you go online you you try and find i mean you know, I turned up uh, with my partner. We were staying in in Berkeley, and I uh, I'd heard about this uh, this you know this this site this 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 shell mound. And, and but the what's what's wonderful in that example, and I'm, we're using that example because we both know it, obviously. But what's wonderful there is is the people that have actively put you know put protest. I mean, it's beautiful when you go down there. There's still signs from from the most recent protests there. You know, when the when the whole landscape was kind of kind of reinvigorated, if you like, with its historical uh, layering, and even online, you see this this idea that if you go online, uh, what I thought was wonderful for me, coming from a kind of English context, was I was able to explore the historical maps that that people have put up on the on the Save West Berkeley Shell Mound site. That, that show even as you know 1850 you know when you when the development of the bay area these sites are clearly marked on the map and unfortunately what's happened is is they just haven't been protected over over the the, the you know the previous 200 years or something so i mean obviously that's not to say that hasn't happened in in england as well um 
but we haven't suffered from colonialism on that on that brutal layering that um that other places have you know and that, and that's it's kind of harsh to see but um you know like one of the, one of the other sites that i went and traveled to when i was in california was um was in a place called volcano sort of um it's it's miwok land um and there's a, a an amazing grinding stone there and in fact quite a bit of land around that and it's just beautifully set up um protected land and and i found that very powerful because that that was very much um there was a sense i mean there was there was a sense to the landscape that the natural beauty, the natural sacredness was there as well. And what it did was it got me um, really reading up about, um, you know, Milwaukee culture and, and the way in which particularly I was fascinated because one of the key kind of uh, food sources uh, was, was acorns and an acre and my previous book that I, I spent quite a lot of time writing because I always spend ages writing a book, is, was called The Oak Papers and was all about uh, the relationship between humans and oak trees uh, around the globe. So I was particularly fascinated with this idea that, I, you know, you could go to this beautiful landscape. And yes, unfortunately, there were there were still, you know, scars from from mining, you know, from gold mining there. But but there was that still this sense that you could feel in the landscape of this of this connection to to how people had lived there for thousands and thousands and yet lived harmoniously on this landscape. There was sacredness there. And I'd really, I'd re if you haven't been there, I'd really recommend going there. It was, it was a fantastic trip, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you, you, as we say, Laura, you know, you, you, these brutal aspects like colonialism, they, they, they tend to, they have tended to not respect um, indigenous sacred sites. And, and so, there's a great project for everybody to be seeking them out in their local landscapes. I really do. I think that's such an important part. Uh, yeah, and what, what I hear you saying in, in what you're sharing of your experience is that it's really about uh, learning and uh, learning from, from the people who, who are from that particular place. And um, I'm, just, I'm feeling compelled to just encourage anyone who wants to, to learn more yeah yeah that's right i mean i think um like one of the one of the real insights that are, are kind of reminders i had in fact how is how the outsider can often make you re-see your local landscape and I, i'm not saying but in, in my local landscape for example um i have a good friend abdul who's actually you know from from syria originally and you know i know from university and I had him, he was over my, in my in my kind of home territory here. And we were walking in, in the Essex countryside. And it was he that said said to me, Oh yeah, of course, all in we walked past my local church, which is um is is quite a very considered church, about 800 years old. It's actually what's called a round church, in that they're only so they were built by the Crusaders, a particular um kind of order called the Order of the Knights Hospitallers. And when they returned from uh, Jerusalem and the Holy Lands, um, they were often given land and they built these churches. So you could get a lot of visitors to my village to see this church. Abdul and I were walking past there, you know, a few years ago, as, as I say, when I was starting to write Grounded. Um, and he said, isn't it, isn't it true that all churches in England are built on um, on pagan sites, on on pre-Christian sacred sites, and I was kind of like, yeah, yeah, you know, you're 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 pretty much there, Abdul. Yeah, I mean that's that's true. And then I thought about it, and we we continued to walk, and we walked around, um, you know, a few mile walk, and I suddenly realised that that in fact, even though my local village, you know, uh, was a very considered church in in you know in the English kind of context, in fact unusually that land was given would have been given just as no no there would be no previous uh that probably i mean i've done a lot of research to try and find but there's pre probably nothing there before it's just that the, the local landowner was benevolently giving it to these these good crusaders that had just returned from their their holy uh tasks and so, in fact, even though it was, it was seen in the modern context as quite an important church, 
there is no sacredness beneath it. Whereas you go two miles or mile and a half down the road to, and I'm in Little Maplestead. If you go to Great Maplestead, much more kind of uh, less considered church, but much more standard, if you like. But I know from my research that in uh, in mid-Victorian times, one of the uh, local gardeners dug up a whole series of Bronze Age burial urns right next to the church. And this church is, and so these dates, sorry, these date from like 4,000 years ago. The church is probably seven, 800 years old. But the whole site, and this again, it's as we say, it's, it's on a very nice uh, high point looking out over um, some streams and little valleys that run down to the river. And uh, and so perfectly situated, but actually has been a sacred site for way beyond Christian worship in this lands. So, you know, exploring your local landscapes is great, but often if you can do it just with uh, with someone from from outside those places, often that's that's really good because then you do also you just see the difference if you like you 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 get a different look at your own place. So yeah, that can be really good. Yeah. And that, that's fascinating, the different histories between locations near you that are so close together. Mm. Mm. I'm kind of curious to, to talk a little bit more about place because you, you really engage place through those specific landscapes and, and sites that you talk about. So can, can you say a little bit more about how you understand place in, in relation to the sacred and also to ancestral lineages? Mm. Yeah, it's... it's um. I think I think I mean one of the modules that I teach is is called um, is called psychogeography, and I don't know if this is a term that many of you might have come across, but it's essentially a, a way of understanding human practice on landscape, on place, if you like, and often the the way to understand, I think place or to explore it i think is this idea this notion of the palimpsest this idea of layer upon layer upon one thing being there previous and then going and very much i think you, if you see this in terms of you know sort of human urban context it can be fascinating to see the the layerings of, of human practice there but as we're saying even even with this um even even in a, in a kind of very rural place like this uh, it can be fascinating to see what happens in a in a rural churchyard over thousands of years. Um, I mean, a, another a, a good example of of my kind of local landscapes, and I, I talk about them as I say because I've researched them more. So you, you, I'm able to talk about place in depth in the specifics of of that context. And there's so again during COVID lockdown had my a uh, very uh, tired bicycle, but it would get me about four miles. That was about as far as I could manage pretty much um, to, to a little village, uh, oh, oh, two villages over. And this is a village, very interesting village. It's called Altham Stone. And what, what, what there is there on this place is you have a church, seventh century church, a beautiful old church, um, very old church as well. And then around it are these series of very large, what we call sarsen stones. So they're stones that have been um, dropped there by glaciers a long time ago during the Ice Age. Um, but they weren't all dropped collectively around this churchyard. So what we know is that is that in some way, at some point in human history, people have moved them there. Now, there's various then then arguments as to like well, what what's what's been going on here did the christians move them here no the christians did you know the early christians who set up this site they didn't move them there so what's happened on this place is again this idea of the, of the palimpsest so uh, uh, through time so the argument is probably these were moved by the early farming community so as i said earlier about the, the idea of west kennet these idea of long barrows where farmers would gather large stone uh, to create a kind of monument on the landscape, on the place, to kind of mark the place as, as, as vitally important. And where I live in East Anglia, there is no natural stone apart from what they can find. So these large sarsens 
appear to have been gathered um, on this um, on this particular site. And then again, if you if you if you dig into the records, you see that this place was also so was also used by the Bronze Age, and we have a, again a series of burial urns that seem to mark the the place as sacred four thousand years ago. So what you potentially have is you have you know, 6,000 years ago, perhaps even, the early farmers moving these stones. You then have sort of 4,000 years ago-ish um, people using this site in the Bronze Age as a sacred place. And then in the Christian era, uh, you have sort of 7th century Christians taking the site because it has already sacred elements to it, to the local people, to, to the people around and that the incoming religion marks the site. And again, you know, we're talking about um, place. Um, this place is, is, is beautiful. And, it, and again, it's, it's a raised bit of land that looks out over a, a big river valley, the store valley that marks the difference between the, the counties of Essex and Suffolk. And we know that in that, in that valley landscape, there are even earlier markings of, um, of, of what we call curses or the, these sort of strange um, mark, markers on the landscape. They're not always quite sure what they're about, but they could well be to do with the migration pathways of, of ancient creatures like oryx, which were the, the, um, the pre-domesticated cattle that would roam uh, Britain, you know, kind of six foot to the shoulder. And that our, our earliest ancestors would, would kind of certainly kind of relate to, but they would also hunt. Um, in that sense, they were the large um, herbivores of the landscape. So again, delving as much as possible into the layers of history in place, I think, is is one of the ways in which we can see human activity over time. Um, and, and in my case, what I tend to do is I tend to do that to do with um, archaeology and to do with the, the the kind of patterns of human existence in place. Uh, over thousands of years, if you like. I, I'm curious if you can can say a little bit more about in in engaging with those different timescales that you've mentioned, and mm. how in your work you found that that it was possible to to engage with those different timescales that as you were writing the book, and mm. you you so easily move move between stories and and um, information about those different time scales. I'm curious if you could you could talk about that uh, thinking 6,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago or 1,000 mm -hmm. years ago into the present. <laughs> yeah, it's fun, isn't it? It's really fun, I think. Um, I think, I, well, I think one of the things is that in the, you know, in the, in the US context, for example, you can go to, you can go to the native peoples, if you like, of your lands um, 300 years ago. And it, it, in Britain, to go to the the native peoples, you have to go, well, probably 6,000 years back um, to get to that same kind of um, people of people hunting, gathering, tending the wild, you know, uh, living, it appears in a way that's a lot more harmonious with the landscape than we seem to have ever existed in, in England, I'm, I'm talking now, in the thousands of years since, and in the American context in the last sort of 300 years or something. If you look at the, the way in which um, we tend to treat a lot of other living beings in the landscape, other, you know, the landscape itself, we don't, we don't tend to treat it with that kind of sacred eyes that the indigenous native people often do, often, you know, I mean, largely did. And I find it in, in the English context, the difficulty is that you have to go back 6,000 years. But what's fascinating when you do is you see the landscape and, and the, the context of it really transform. So, so again, just to give the example, for example, of, of Stonehenge, and I use that because I, I imagine everyone can think, oh, yeah, that's, that's such a marker on the, on the English landscape. It's, you know, everyone can kind of picture it. Um, but the truth is that obviously the, that there were this on the Stonehenge, why Stonehenge was placed there was because of what had happened there before. So if we 
if we can then examine what was going on before Stonehenge, I mean, Stonehenge was built by the farming communities to mark this, this land. And before the stones were put there, there, there was a wooden structure there. But then if you go, I mean, what I found fascinating is um, you can go just sort of literally to two miles up the hill um, from Stonehenge to a place called uh, Coneybury, a little hill. You won't see you won't see much there anymore. But some archaeologists did some work there and they found what, what's now known as the Coneybury anomaly. And this is um, it's a feasting pit that the archaeologists dug out. And it's absolutely fascinating because it, it, it shows us the pre-Stonehenge landscape. So it's from around 3800 BC, uh, which in Britain is the time where you had the first farming communities moving in from Europe. And um, what you have at Coneybury is you have this you have this evidence of a feast, big feast, possibly like, you know, midsummer, this kind of idea that quite potentially it could well be, you know, marking the, the highest apex of the sun, et cetera. It could be in winter. We're not quite sure. It's very difficult to tell exactly. But what they've, what the archaeologists have done, and this is absolutely fascinating, is that they, um, they've done DNA analysis on all the bones of the, of the animals that were brought to this feast. And they've established that there were essentially four groups of people that came to this feast, that met up from around, you know, maximum of 20 kilometers away. And they think three of these groups of people were um, brought what, what would have been domesticated cattle, early domesticated cattle. So they were kind of essentially three groups of the earliest farming communities on that Stonehenge landscape. Stonehenge doesn't exist at this point, if you know what I mean. You've got to wait another, what, 1500 years or something before Stonehenge is built. But what you have there is these three groups meeting. And then this this uh, the, the majesty of this of this fourth group that um that they identify uh there are whole deer that were brought to this feast and even um uh fascinatingly uh, a beaver's tail they discovered a bit of beaver tail was brought to this feast and they say this fourth group are the last remnants of the indigenous hunter gatherer communities that lived on that landscape um, up until around what 3,800 BC, so you know, quite a long six. Let's just say six thousand years ago or something. And what what's what's beautiful about this um, appears to be beautiful about this meeting is that you had these two groups that were meeting up for a kind of for, for a feast. There's no evidence of violence between them. There's no evidence of the the farming communities coming in and taking over the land violently from these. Uh, hunter-gatherer communities, but you have this meeting uh, over you know, a couple of miles from Stonehenge, and what what will what will evolve over time is that these these farming communities will see this landscape as as they will recognise it as sacred to the people that came before, and they will mark it, and what they'll eventually mark it with is Stonehenge. Um, so it's fascinating again this idea. Um, I think it's fascinating if you go into you know, the depths of, of human history, you, you get these incredible, I mean, archaeologists are brilliant for kind of uh, the, the scientists and the DNA and the isotopic analysis and this, this process of, our, of our, you know, aspects of our modern world that they're able to delineate what was going on in the deep past is, is really fascinating. Um, I mean, um, and actually one of the, one of the sites that I talk about in the book is uh, alongside Coneybury is, is, is really just down the road from Stonehenge. Um, and it's called Blick Mead. And they've been, uh, I was working with an amazing archeologist there, uh, David Jacks, and he's, he's, he's uncovered this site that is again, way pre Stonehenge. So it dates right from the last stages of the ice ages. So the last sort of 10,000 years or so, this has been uh, it's a sacred it's a spring. So it's, so it's you know, it, it, it's where you can get fresh water. And what seems to have happened there is that you had the the pre domesticated cattle, these oryx, these huge um, animals would go and water there and that you have he's uncovered something like 100,000 and 
and rising Mesolithic flints, these tiny little flint splinters that shows that people were going there and spending a lot of time there. Um, and what he's also uncovered, which is really very, very rare, that it seems to be a platform that seemed to be constructed to make it easier for the animals to drink from the spring. So, you know, and again, this all, this all dates right through from, as I say, from um, 10,000 years, uh, right the way through. You have evidence all the way through of, of, of humans going there uh, up until the, the period of Stonehenge, people going there and, and treating the site as sacred in some way. And, um, and the, the importance of water, as we know, in, in, to all people is, is absolutely vital. And this, this idea, often you, you find this if you, if you delve back into the deeper, in deeper time, that humans were far more um, appreciative of the value of, of you know, fresh drinking water and how, how sacred that could be. You know, the idea of the sacred spring, the sacred stream, I think, I think should run deep. And I often think that it, perhaps in our modern way, um, I mean, I like, as you say, I like, I like playing with the idea of stepping into the mindset of what it would have been like to live as a human on a landscape 6,000 years ago, say. But it's often very good to bring it back to our current um, existence, if you like, and the climate emergency and, you know, what we can do as individuals. And, and I think if you do start to recognise the sacredness of place and of landscape, you do treat it different. You you treat everything differently. I mean, you, you, Laura, you know from your work with with plants and trees. Once you start to see them in a different context, not just as wood or as something to eat, then you you do start to have a very different relationship with the landscape. I think, and and that can only be for good. Can only be for good, and probably quite vital that we do. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, I I would agree, and, and seeing. Mm seeing the landscape a little differently. And uh, I was just thinking as well in terms of the different timescales that you were mentioning and the different sacred sites. I, I had the opportunity to go to Stonehenge myself and just recognizing how it's still very much uh, an ongoing sacred site for a lot of people. People come yeah. from all over the world to, to see it. And, um, and, and I appreciate how you're bringing in that, that those kinds of experiences of, of connecting with the landscape and, and seeing landscape differently can mm. can feed into different actions that that could help with, with climate change and some of the environmental concerns. That yeah, I think that's right, isn't it? I mean, like we say, even with water, you know, if you if you appreciate, I mean, it's amazing if you you go traveling to somewhere where just turning your tap on, your faucet on, and you have boiling hot water coming out is is that's not a standard. You so appreciate it when you have hot water coming out of the tap, you know, and if you have if you haven't got drinking water and then you come back to your kind of, you know, wherever you live, if you suddenly appreciate drinking water, you don't you don't leave your taps on. You don't leave it wasting away kind of thing. Um, and I think that, again, I mean, it's slightly stepping away from this idea of of place. But in some ways, it's not in, in that if you go back to our ancestors one of the things that I found particularly fascinating that I, um, that came into this book grounded as well was this idea of, of how humans often mark place. And, and one of the key things they often mark is, is streams, rivers, um, you know, as I say, sacred, sacred springs, sacred sites of water uh, are often pretty key to what's going on. If you go back, you know, a few thousand years, because it's it, the humans are living in a in a far more connected space with the natural world. Um, whereas, perhaps, I mean, in some ways, you could argue we have it easy now, but perhaps that's coming back to bite us because you know we're creating this disastrous uh, consequence. Unfortunately, um, you know, and and I think one of the things interestingly is the idea that if you go back into the say i mean one of the sites one of the beautiful um monuments that i went to see is is a is a small wooden figurine um 
carved in in pine um about four thousand years old that is um that comes from east london little figure human figure stylized human figure and that was found by workmen when they when they were digging um a brook a, a small stream digging up in it just in east london really on the edges of east london and again it was it was clearly placed there 4,000 years ago, as some sort of human marker on that landscape. That seems to be, that's that's what all the archaeologists would say. Um, and I, I went down to, it's now in a, in a beautiful little museum, um, and I went down to see this figure. It's known as the Dagenham Idol. Uh, it comes from an area called Dagenham in East London. Um, and and I went down to see it, and I, I said to the curator, I said, would, would it be possible, could you, could you tell me where, could you mark on a map exactly where that that figure was placed in the landscape because i'd like to go and see it you know i'd like to go and see that place this is kind of what i do and she, she's a lovely woman and she said uh she said yeah and she and she said but uh you won't see much because it's in like aisle three of the local massive supermarket just off the motorway so you know this is this is how we as modern humans have seen that same sacred space if you like and obviously um it's a kind of um simple example but it, it shows how in so many ways i think the the simplicity of connection with aspects of the natural world that were marked in the past um we just don't we just we, we struggle to to find that connection now and we have to kind of work harder to uh to to make those connections if you like yeah, I agree. And and one of the ways that we both have, have made that connection or that we've we've worked towards that those relationships with um, I would say non-human beings is is through trees. And um your your previous book, the, the Oak Papers, you you connected with a particular tree, the, the honeywood oak there in Essex. And mm. you also talk in this book about um trees almost as, as keepers of the place-based sacredness. Mm. So the, the the trees as as holding something of that that sacredness in the landscape, maybe if there's a possibility of conserving or protecting those those trees, that the landscape could could remain rather than the supermarket potentially. Um, yeah. yeah. But I'm I'm curious how your relationship with trees. If well, maybe if you could tell tell everyone mm -hmm. a little bit about your relationship with with trees, and then if it's changed in writing this book. Yeah, thanks, Laura. I think that that's that's very sweet of you. I, I um, yeah, for, for the book Oak Papers, I spent quite a lot of time, um, not permanently, but uh, kind of almost daily, uh, beside. A, very fortunate to have an eight hundred year old oak tree quite near, between where I I live and where I worked at that time, and I'd spend a lot of time by this tree, and it became a, a thing that I did. Um, it's on a small English estate. So I was able to go there when there were no other humans around. And that kind of creates a very different relationship in some ways. Um, I was there in all seasons, you know, days and nights. Um, and as, as you very well know, Laura, from your work, that the sense of, of recognizing that that tree, if you like, in, in this case, um, but many other, um, you know, living beings, that it is an individual living being. And the point about trees, which I think you, you make very well, really, is, uh, with that idea of marker, is that they don't move, you know, whereas we as humans, we spend all our time kind of wandering around all over this, this landscape, whereas trees, they're born and they die on that same spot. And that's, there's something extremely powerful when you think about place and that idea of sacredness um, in, that, in that simple fact. And I think... Um, as you say, my in terms of that idea of kind of relationship with trees, I think I still very much uh, spend a lot of time when I can, kind of trying to remind myself to to notice the trees. If you like, if you go to somewhere new, you kind of you keep you keeping an eye for where they are, and to return to old favourites, if you like. And I think that's something that I do, even in grounded. I can't keep the trees out. I had a, I was very fortunate. I got. A, be fantastic local illustrator um to do some of the illustrations for the book 
and um, without spoiling some of the, the context of the book, there's a particular tree that I went to in, in the oak papers that I write about in the oak papers. That's an oak tree that you can climb into quite easily. That's just about a, a mile or so from my house. And uh, it's, it's on a place called uh, Two Oak Hill, uh, or I call it Two Oak Hill. And um, it's this beautiful, it's a beautiful tree. And there's, there's uh, I used to spend quite a lot of time in the tree and I'd, I'd have these moments uh, where I would write about it and I, and I call, I'd, I'd kind of write about it. I'd spend a lot of time there. I felt very connected with this tree. Occasionally I'd have to, I kind of got slightly freaked out that I was this kind of grown up adult that was sitting in a tree and you'd have dog walkers walking there. And I think, Oh my goodness, what are they going to think of me? You know? And uh, so I'd sort of scumper down. Um, but it's um yeah it was called I, I'd always call it the stag headed oak, and um because it's it's an old oak and it had this kind of stag horned effect on on the roof of it, um and it's and 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 it's always been one of the marker points on the landscape as you say that I would that I would walk to and uh, I think that becomes very interesting that in 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 terms of this sort of discussion of sacred landscape in that you start to see trees as markers of another landscape of sacredness that's not being created by humans and and in a way it kind of links to this idea that if you go far enough back in time and depending on where you live it doesn't have to be too far that there was a a far closer kind of empathy to a kind of a sacred natural landscape uh, and I think trees are great at, at kind of reminding of us that but you know when I if you take people to a tree they and you kind of introduce them to a tree if that doesn't sound too odd um, they love it like everyone loves a tree that you just got to kind of introduce them to it and then I did this recently I had a couple of friends over from Tasmania and uh, so I, I walked you know we went for a walk to to the stag headed oak on two oak hill and we all went and kind of said hi to this tree we didn't actually climb up into it i have to say but uh, uh yeah that could have got messy but um it was really good it was really nice and i you know and, and um so yeah as as you know um laura so well um humans and trees and humans and plants have a a close and an integral relationship and i think it, it they it's an, we could do another hour perhaps talking about the the kind of sacred layerings that the natural world give us alongside those that the human context gives us and often there's a there's a nice knit between them as you say if you look to most indigenous peoples there's a far tighter knit between those two yeah, thank you for for that and and i think the way that you talk about going back to the same tree again the stag headed oak or the honeywood oak and mm -hmm. c continuing to connect introducing others to the, to the tree that that's similar to the way that that i've related to to trees as well just in, in mm -hmm. terms of of building that connection and um, getting to know that that tree in that place over time over different seasons and and seeing it in different uh, moods of my own in different aspects of that particular place so so i'm curious yes. yeah i'm curious thinking about how how centered the book is on on the english landscape and the english countryside since that's your home and and where mm. you you've been mm. um, and the, the title of the book mentions our ancestors I'm, I'm curious how how your work applies to those outside of england or or those not of english mm. descent yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I think I wanted to get across was this idea of it's it's a healthy pursuit, I think, to explore what the landscapes that we live in were like for not just us uh, and our, our immediate kind of kin, but for our, our kind of more distant ancestors. And that's, I think the idea of our is just a sense of kind of unifying the search, if you like, because we, you know, we've, 
we've talked we've talked a little bit today about you know the the impact of 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 colonialism of imperialism um i could spend far longer talking about that but we wouldn't be able to give it we'd need another hour wouldn't we you know but i think if you if you do if you do go to landscapes where you have i mean in in you know in some ways i could talk about the english landscape as being a colonial landscape and then other landscapes as being colonized landscapes and that you know it's it's the kind of brutalizing aspect of that is often clear once you do the work and the, and the, that as i say west berkeley shell mound for example the research that people have done there for example brings the truth out of how important that site is and and how much as you say in today's context it is still an important integral sacred site and and you could you can if you get in the british context say going to the local church up the road that is just a kind of local village church you you can see there that yes okay it's it's a christian site and it's a colonial uh if you like uh site as well in the um it's it's a crusader site and and as i say again that that tension of recognizing the importance of that i know you know particularly when i was say walking there with my friend abdul who comes from from syria from from the near east and this idea that this is a site that was given to the those people that had returned from the colonial action of going to others' lands on kind of religious war uh, footing. It, it becomes complex. It becomes really complex. But I think what you can do, and that's perhaps why I like going to 6,000 years ago, is that in some ways I feel that there's a, there's a connection that I want to make. I want, I want their, the relationship with, with those people, with, with our ancestors of, of that period to be more present, to be more um, immediate uh, and, and to recognize perhaps the way in which those hunter gatherer communities lived in their landscapes, in, in our landscapes was, was, was a kind of, a, you know, a template for how perhaps we can live a little better today, if you like. I really appreciate how you're bringing in the, the complexities of the, the landscape and the land and and the, the beautiful, the terrible, the and, and really learning those things and, and bringing them forward as a way to connect to the sacredness with the land. So I, I'm curious if you would be willing to share, uh, if you don't mind sharing a, a little bit about what you're working on now or what, what's exciting you now in your, in your next project. Yeah, no, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm, um, I've actually, since I moved from, from London, uh, 20 years ago now, which feels like amazing. I moved to this where you can probably see bits of it, this kind of old farm laborers cottage. Um, and, uh, when I moved here with my partner, we uh there was a small field for sale at the back and if you come from london the idea of a field what like a field we can like um so we bought we bought this small sort of two acre field and i've been working um well, kind of for years really of writing about this this field because what i've been doing is i've been kind of um bringing nature back a kind of a kind of nature restoration project uh, particularly over the last few years, last sort of 10, 15 years. So it's now what was once just a kind of barren green uh, desert, if you like, that you would have to mow constantly to kind of keep it. It's now, it's it's got kind of, yeah, uh, 20 foot high oak trees. It's got a big pond in it. It's got meadows that I sort of scythe by hand. And um, so I've been writing about this project and, and that book's now, um, yeah, it's, it's working towards completion. Actually, we've got, we've got kind of contracts in place and it's just, um, we I'm trying not to call it rewilding because uh, um, the, the term rewilding is being kind of banded around quite a lot. But uh, at the moment, I think I'm calling it renaturing. 
And I, I kind of quite like that. So it's not my term, it's a friend's term, but I think we're going with that. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Um, and and in, a, in, in a slightly more distant future, if you like, what I really want to do is you probably got up from, from our discussion today is I want to write a book that goes back into hunter-gatherer existence on, on the planet and the idea of tending the wild because we tend to see hunter-gatherers in very kind of stark uh, imagery that they are have really kind of short, brutish lives and that they're, li they're living very uh, poor lives. But, you know, anyone who does any research into, into the the native peoples that lived on landscapes, they, they tended to hunt and gather and they'd look after the land, they tend it, they tend the wild, this beautiful phrase, and um, they had a lot of time as well to do other things so it's that's a book that I'm, I'm kind of looking to work on but it'll probably be knowing me at least three years before that one gets to the page <laughs> oh it's exciting and I, I appreciate the way that that it seems like you're you're narrowing in further and further on on the local place that you're at that that your next book is about your yeah that's very true that's very true yeah very, it's very, very much local. It, but it, and and doing that thing of kind of like looking really closely and then going bing, you know, like seeing the wider like why we need to rewild, you know, half of the the globe, that kind of idea, uh, why or bring nature back, let's say, you know, allow nature its space. So yeah, absolutely, it's 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 a really good way of going. But I mean, as I say, someone like Wendell Berry shows us that perfectly. You know, focus on the local, do what you can there, see global, yeah. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Well, I think now is a great time to take some questions from the audience. Yeah, so great. We, we have a few here. So um, there are, from the audience, um, what are some practices or techniques that people can use to start getting connected to places near them, especially if they're not living on the lands of their own ancestors? Mm, that's a very good question, isn't it? Um, practices or techniques. I mean, I like that. I think we sort of touched on on some of this i think you know that kind of like basic sense of like kind of getting i mean two things i'd say probably one get out on the land if you like you know um in the and it's difficult like say you're living in i don't know suburban worlds which is where i come from suburban london you know where how, how can you see that how can you see that but often it's still possible in some ways I mean, I mean, Laura, like we were chatting about Berkeley just because I spent some time there and we were talking about what's called, is it called Indian rock or something like that? Which again, is like just this kind of clearly a natural marker within that you know, suburban landscape, if you like. But it's a, there's clearly something going on there, you know, and it's a beautiful place to go to. Um, so that's one thing I'd always say is like, just get out into the landscape and see it, see it and feel it. You know, that kind of thing of, because often if you do, like you just, well, there's nothing much. Oh, there's that tree over there. And then you go to the tree and then you're like, oh, this is quite nice. Actually, this is quite a nice little pocket of land here or whatever. Uh, and then the, the obvious other thing to do is to say, is to do the research, you know, do, do, the, do the, the other form of footwork, which is the kind of delving in and, um, as I say, you know, like something like the the West Berkeley Shellmound, I mean, the research that people have done so that you can, so, you know, any of us can now go online to the site and there's this be beautiful tracing through history by using the historical maps, this kind of layerings of maps to show how this, you know, this important sacred site has been, um, well, kind of at one point that the railroad comes through one of the shell mounds you know so it's kind of again if you do your research you can see what was what was there on the landscape and often it's 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 it, it's fairly recent history that's uh that's erased it that's put the concrete down if you like so um yeah those are two ways that i think you can do kind of almost wherever you are and i do say that coming from as i say coming from suburban london um i would still uh, even as a youth, I'd often spend my time kind of, I don't know, even like hanging out in graveyards. They were often like the places where you had a bit of nature and a bit of uh, kind of quiet. And they were a bit sacred, if you like, away from the shopping malls. I think avoid shopping malls. I think they're probably fairly unsacred places, actually. Yeah. <laughs> 
We'd have to see how we can renature the shopping mall. Yeah, maybe we should renature. Yeah, or resacralize shopping yeah. malls. That would be a good yeah. good thing. Yeah, yeah. I I did want to add, if if you don't mind, the, the something I think you've done so beautifully is also to to creatively express your experience in that in that place. Mm. Your books are such a, a a wonderful way that you've done that. Others may have other ways of expressing creatively, but that's a great. Well, that's very, that's really very kind of you, Laura. I, 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 uh, I spend a lot of time, you know, I spend a lot of time. They don't, they don't just dash off. Honestly, there's, uh, um, I often, I sometimes show, show my, I showed my students, for example, in, uh, in lockdown, um, I'd sort of say, look, this is, and I'd get the files out of like, say, oak papers when I completed it. Say, look, this is the drafts that I've done of, these are the edits, you know? So, um, yeah, it's kind of you. It's, uh, it's, it's a labor of love I, you know i would say i would say definitely yeah but um it's yeah it's good work it's fun so another question for people who've been forcibly displaced from their homelands what are some practices you would suggest to recon to reconnect the, to their ancestral sacred sites yeah that's a really um important question i guess one of the first things i'd say is connect with those people um, you know, with whatever the, uh, whether you've got, you know, whether it's, uh, I, I don't know, whatever the, 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 the peoples are, whoever are still on those lands, if there's any presence connect with those people, if you can, again, I mean, it's, it's not a dissimilar in, in some ways to the previous question in the sense that I'd say there's kind of almost two ways of going about it, isn't there? One is to, is to, is to get onto the land. And 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 an experience being on that land as much as possible. But as you say, if you've been removed from the land, then connecting up with the people that were from that from those lands, I think, can be can be extremely powerful. And 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 we see this again as we as we said, you know, uh, the 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 Miwok grinding stone at volcano. There's clearly there, for example, and this is just I'm just using the examples that I've visited recently. Um, that's a that's a a brutal example of where the indigenous people of the native people have been removed from that land and now to a certain extent are able to re remember uh the the full extent of that landscape if you like um and obviously in in certain parts of the united states it's more difficult to do that practice you know you know, you, you go to like Yosemite, for example, um, and, you you know, it's like clearly Yosemite, for example, is an, is an amazing place of natural beauty. But if you even just dig in a little bit into the, the history of, of the removal of, of people from that landscape and, and the, the kind of brutal layering to what is today uh you know a wonderful site of natural wonder that we go and visit i think it's really important not obviously not to forget the past and not to forget the practices that took place uh on the on on that on those lands uh, if, if we do that we are re really lost i think so yeah doing the research as well i think is is a uh, is such a vital part of all this of of kind of kind of uh remembering truths is 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 really important to us as humans i think yeah, yeah. i think this also speaks to just the the privilege of, of having access to sacred and yeah. magical lands as well yeah um, that that's so true i mean and, and and to go to the you know to to go to I mean it's very fortunate to go to Yosemite as I say this this May and I'd never been there before and it it, it is obviously it's it's a beautiful beautiful you know valley and and, and site but um, I was you know the the day before I'd been at Volcano and there's a there's a an amazing museum there really impressive museum um, and there were there were very powerful images in the museum. But because it's such really relatively recent history, when I'm talking about 6,000, 9,000 years ago, if you talk about, there was a photograph there of a, of a woman 
who as a child had been removed from Yosemite. And there was an actual photograph of this woman, you know, in her older age. But it was that, you know, when you have photographic evidence of an individual human that's been removed from that landscape, that's an extremely powerful and affecting thing. Um, and then the next day we, you know, we went to Yosemite and obviously were bowled over, but fortunately I had these sort of little nugget of, of truth there. So don't, you know, don't forget that sort of thing. You know, it's important, isn't it? Yeah. Very important. Yeah, really important. Mm. So another question, uh, do you sure. practice any kind of ancestral meditation, either for your own ancestors or those that you visit? That's that's a really interesting one. It's um no, I I don't actively um practice any kind of ancestral meditation. It's it, it there might there might be a cultural thing to a certain extent. Um that in Britain I don't know quite what that would mean, if you like, but I, I certainly practice meditation and Often that is at a a site of. I mean, we we talked earlier about this idea of um, the tree and the connection with the tree, and I, and I would often find that that when you are in the presence of a, you know, and, a, and particularly let's say when I was going to an eight hundred year old oak tree, you're most kind of enticed into a kind of meditative practice by being in that presence, if I can put it like that. And I was very fortunate in that. I think in terms of um, my my time with this 800 year old tree um, would often be when there were no other humans around. So it's much easier to to appreciate the kind of meditative space that that tree would offer, if you like, if I can put it like that. Um, and in a way, I mean, I guess the closest I would suggest to a kind of ancestral practice, um, ancestral meditation was that um, one of the things that I found extremely powerful about kind of having this time this meditative time beside an 800 year old oak tree was i would often be kind of trying to um think of the generations of humans if you like or the, the impact of that notion of this tree had stood there for 800 years as generations of humans had gone through and was trying to, you know, going back to the sort of 12th century when this tree was there um, and imagining the people. And it, we know that it was owned, the lands then were owned by monks, a particular kind of uh, religious order. And um, it was kind of very, very powerful often to kind of, not necessarily feel their presence, I wouldn't say that, but to imagine their presence. Um, so I guess that would be kind of one of the closest um, kind of formal meditative kind of practices, I'd say. And and again, if you go to um, some of these sites, like we say, um, if you go to, say, West Kennet, Long Barrow, or you go, and again, as we're saying, Stonehenge is, is, is clearly very important to an, a lot of people i i struggle i have to say i struggle to go and feel any kind of kind of spiritual meditative sense when that when you've got lots of other people around i find that really difficult i i almost need to be um sort of still in in the in the site uh in order to be able to feel any kind of um impact if you like but um what about Laura? can i throw that to you uh, uh not to you know as we would say chuck you under the bus but uh um do, is that is is ancestral meditation is that something that you would practice or yeah, that, that's a great question I, I similar to you i i don't have a particular ancestral meditative practice mm. I, I do meditate as well and um mm. find myself called to different places and, and as you were speaking I was actually thinking about research and the way that you've done mm. such deep research as a kind of ancestral practice almost uh, so I might say that for myself as well that I, I don't have any ancestral meditation practices myself I, I understand there are very powerful practices mm. out there that can help people connect 
with their own mm. history and their own ancestry. Um, something that I uh, have have looked into, but uh, n not as not as deeply as to to practice anything myself. Um, I I also find that that individual connection and and being in in the land and being with the land and with the with the trees and especially particular spots and, and going back again and again and yeah getting to know that that place from a lived experience so mm -hmm. as you have been mentioning even in an urban landscape sometimes there are particular spots or trees or tiny patches of, of parkland between the buildings that can really can really feel special in a certain mm. way as well yeah i think that's very well put i think that's really well put um and 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 i i've I made a note to go and spend a bit of time so uh, of, like exploring that idea of ancestral meditation but in, and particularly in an english context i'm interested in that or british context i should say really um and i will go and ask some people as well um but uh, so so thank you to whoever threw that question over. It's 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 often brilliant in these kind of uh, conversations that you that you leave with two or three lines of inquiry that you're kind of looking forward to go and uh, delve into, if you like. I, I do find that uh, one of the one of the bonuses for me of these kind of chats, uh, if you like. The next question also is one that you you touched on in your last mm. answer. What role does community play in this work and the journey of connecting to place, or is it a solo journey? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a great question because you know we've both just been saying, well, you know, really, you know, I kind of like to be on my own in these places, but uh, yeah, don't get me wrong, like uh, this book wouldn't have been written if if I had if there wasn't a kind of community of people that were all equally interested in in that idea of exploring an ancestral place if, if if we want to say or sacred place and and um so very much i felt um i mean part of the book is that there are kind of two other people that i work with closely two friends you know they're friends mark and selfie um and they they're kind of you know mark's mark's a bit like me he's kind of suburban kid that's ended up in the in the in the fields and selfie's a good old country english country boy and um the three of us all have a fascination with kind of prehistory and with, and with kind of um those kind of aspects to the landscape so again you know that there's a kind of continual conversation between us that runs through the book and and i think this is this is it's it's important like you know if i was just to literally write a book about this is what i think and then i went off on my own and i did this and i if i did i think you know, as humans, like we, you know, I love going off on my own. Do not get me wrong, but we are social beings, and we and we operate in in little gangs and tribes and communities, and and this is what we do, and this it's what what we're good at, if you like. Um, so yeah, very much, and I felt uh, very privileged as well to sort of step into parts of the kind of archaeological community of the prehistory um, gang if you like, um, in writing this book. So there were various people that um, kind of the more eminent um, older generation of, of archaeologists that I was able to kind of have conversations with that were, that were great and that have been studying, like so someone like uh, Richard Bradley, who in, in the British context and, and in fact way beyond the British context, but is a fascinating person to talk to about, about landscape through history because he's been studying it, you know, from uh, Oxford for the last, I don't know, 60 years or something. So to have conversations with someone like that and then bring that into the book. And 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 I mentioned him before, but um, David Jacks, who's just in Britain, has just been called Archaeologist of the Year for his work at Blickmead. He very kindly, I was in touch with him um, from a while back, and and he very kindly got me to go down and and see the site and as I say this is the sacred spring that is the, the kind of the precursor what's what what everyone now calls the cradle to Stonehenge, you know this kind of amazing site that he he's he's, he's been working at he's been because it's on private land so he's been getting kind of two weeks a year for the last sort of ten years and and kind of 
slowly building his way down and then having to pause and and um a community of, of of people working there very much and meeting up with all that that them so yeah it's a really good question it's a really good question because often as we've said you know i think to to really appreciate the a site a sacred site if you like and and even like a tree or a, you know a, a, a natural wonder on the landscape i off I would prefer probably to be on my own or maybe just with a couple of people, you know, in sympathy with, with that idea that you're trying to connect in some way that you're trying to um, link your own thoughts, actions, existence to that site. Uh, and that contrasts extremely well as the question puts to, to, to the community of people. That, and that might be, you know, I mean, I've got organized, as I say, I live in a very rural tiny little village in in england and um i've got a, a talk at, at that same crusader church coming up in a couple of weeks time and that'll be very much a community of my local uh uh neighbors uh that, that get mentioned a little bit in one section of the book because as i say it was about that a part of the book is very is is that idea of how we can all be exploring the local the immediate what's on our doorstep so um yeah linking up with your neighbors i always think is a good thing and that's probably one of the best things that came out of lockdown wasn't it um was that idea of remembering local community and how important that could be definitely yeah, great question really good contrast yeah very good question. And I, I might just add, I, I also often prefer to be alone when, when I feel safe hiking or, or going out. But I've, I've also had really powerful experiences hiking with friends, inviting yeah. them to come for a hike or, or community and ceremony in various various ways and kind of building the sacredness that way. Yeah. Yeah. And it's true. And it's true. Thank you. Because you, you kind of, you've kind of made it painted it a lot nicer I, I often think that i can feel a little bit like the kind of the loner off off in the in the fields but you know i'm very fortunate as i say i teach this wild writing course so we go off on field trips and there's a big group of us um that go off to some fantastic sites and there's a real kind of camaraderie about you know going off and it's freezing cold or it's you know we get soaking wet or you know, everyone's notebooks wet. And, uh, you know, the, this kind of, this kind of uh, united by uh, adversity or something. So yeah, absolutely, and and it, and it's wonderful, isn't it? And one one of the other things that I often think is, um, it's lovely to go out, like say, going out and watching the stars. And that's one of the things I love about living where I do in the, in the countryside is that is that you step out occasionally. You're sort of, oh my goodness, there's a meteor shower, and you might step out. And that's really wonderful when you do that with other people, I think. You kind of go out at night and you you do this thing where you're kind of all sitting there all very quietly and then they go, oh, do you see that one? Oh, yeah. it's kind of like really lovely. I think that's a, that's a, um, a an experience that I'm sure our ancestors would have would have appreciated. You know, they'd have been outside looking at the stars and when, when you had a big meteor shower, that would have, they'd have noticed and I'm sure it's what like you know we often think like as as we were saying before what I love is that idea of connecting to distant ancestors um, and I often think one of the simplest ways is to you know appreciate a fire you know uh as a collective group of people you're sitting around a fire or just go outside and watch the stars you know because that's what our distant ancestors were definitely doing part of the time as well so yeah absolutely good good connections good connections definitely so we have one more question and sure somewhat goes off of what you were just speaking of as well um can you speak to how your research into the history of a place impacts your daily life and experiences in our current world mm. yeah that's a great way for us to think isn't it um I mean, it, it impacts all the time. I have to say, I'm, I'm, again, I think, I think I'm fortunate in that um, I live in this kind of rural world, and so I mean, the kind of everyday is is very much what I'm 
doing if you like in my research in in the sense that I'm often I often I like you for example the book that I'm currently writing up or editing is to do with this field that's just you know 10 yards that direction um and I, I like to do that I like to do that and I, I'm you know, not alone in doing that but I think writing about um the everyday the everyday experience can be a, an extremely powerful thing because I think often people just can connect with that so it, you know if I'm writing about the experience and it, they might not connect with exactly the same thing but if I'm writing about say an, I, I don't know a particular flower that I've suddenly seen come out in the, in the field or something that in some senses that's that's a very kind of quotidian it's a very kind of normal simple thing but if I'm then kind of um, amazed by the the instar the you know the 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 beauty of this kind of patterning inside this this flower that can be something that's in in a sense transcends the everyday and takes you into kind of a different way of of seeing the world you know um you know what hopkins would call the inscape of the flower so you kind of actually fully kind of almost immersed as a human but so so yeah often there's a real strong crossover between my research and and the everyday in that um the two often are very closely associated and, and often i will you know be out walking the fields looking for markers uh of the ancient past as well on on my on my doorstep that's often kind of one of my stepping out from from the study is you step out and you kind of go and walk in this in this landscape in order to um kind of muse but also just to get out for a walk a little bit so yeah connections between the research and the everyday i think are are important i mean they are important and and often uh they they connect up really very nicely i think yeah you must feel that, Laura. You, you, the the trees on your doorstep, the plants on your outside your your house. I do, yeah. I I feel like those that that's part of maintaining, building, and maintaining that relationship with with the trees themselves and and with the place and and keeping the the history in mind, especially here in California. I'm I'm coming yeah, to it as, yeah. a, as a guest and um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And being reminded of that, you know, uh, reminding yourself of that and being reminded of that by that landscape yeah. in an everyday context, in a daily uh, way is you're absolutely right. It, it's so important. It's such an important starting point to come from. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah. Well, James, thank you so much. That's about the end of our time. And just want to say yeah. thank you so much for this fascinating conversation for, for talking with me and so excited for your for your upcoming work as well and really enjoyed the book grounded thank you well thank you laura it's been i've really enjoyed it it's been absolutely fascinating and thank you for your uh, intelligent questions audience and laura both